Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being patient and still being here at uh, this time. Um, I'm, I'll basically be building on, on uh, St uh, Stefan Schott's presentation, who presented the electricity market across Canada and saying they were very fragmented. Uh, so that's why I use the word here, eclectic, uh, but it's really fragmented or, or uh, different types of electricity uh, markets. But the, the bottom line, I want to, uh, well, the general context I want to uh, share with you before starting my presentation is that we've, since this morning we've been talking about uh, climate change policies, decarbonization. If we want to decarbonize the economy, we will have to electrify the economy. The economy. Uh, our, most of our electricity, the energy uses will have to be electric. Not all of them, there'll be biofuels, renewable biofuels, uh, but we'll have to electrify. If you look at all the studies that have been conducted on how to decarbonize the economy, electrification of energy uses is very important. And of course, if we electrify, we need to decarbonize the grid. If we electrify and still continue to burn coal, that doesn't really work. So the idea is to, yes, we want to decarbonize, we will have to electrify, uh, and if we electrify, we should look at how to do it in the cheapest manner. So that's the rationale for basically looking at uh, integration. Um, and in, in North America, as you can see in this map, we already have some groups of uh, states and provinces. Uh, it's been mentioned across Canada, but it's the same in the states, in the US. Every state, every province is in charge of its own electricity markets. This is why we have a very eclectic, very fragmented electricity uh, system across North America. There's nothing like the EU integration. There's nothing like the Nordic country integration. Uh, there's no uh, 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 bottom, uh, uh, a top push for integrating markets. Uh, although we still, we, we already have some kind of region. So I'm showing you here the Northeast Power Coordinating Council, the NPCC, which creates a set of states, basically New York and New England, plus Quebec, uh, Ontario, and some maritime provinces. It's already a group of states. There's already an council, an organization looking at these uh, different markets, but only from a reliability perspective, only from um, a, a reliability and grid perspective. So, but I'm, the reason why I'm using that uh, set of provinces and states, it's because it's all, it already makes sense. We're already interconnected. There's already some kind of collaboration, although it's extremely tiny, and there's huge diversity. And so uh, another slide to show you the diversity across these different uh, provinces and states is here, uh, Ontario, Quebec, Maritimes, New England, and New York. And here you see three information for each group. You see the total amount of uh, 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 the load, the energy consumption for every uh, region, the installed capacity and the population. And the one thing I want to highlight here is Quebec. And you see Quebec, it has a relatively small population to 8.2 million in terms of population. So that's uh, uh, half of the uh, New York population, about half of the Ontario population, about again half the New England population. But our electricity consumption is way higher than any of these. This makes of Quebecers like huge electricity users. And there's a good reason for that because we have plenty of it. We have plenty of it, and as Stefan showed in, in one of his slides, we pay a very low price for it because it's a lot of cheap hydro. So we have a lot of cheap hydro, and instead of selling it to our neighbors who could buy it for a higher price than what we're paying it, we basically consume it and we, we heat our basements, which are mostly not used most of the time, and we heat our pools, our swimming pools, uh, deep in the, in the autumn, in the fall, and, uh, and very early in the spring, because electricity is cheap, so we use it. You know, it's there, it's cheap, we use it. Now, is it optimal? Is it the right way of doing it? Of course not. Every economist, and actually I've been most of my academic career talking about the need for integrating markets because we are using, we overuse electricity in Quebec because it's cheap. And then in Ontario, we built uh, nuclear power plants and we refurbish nuclear power plants in Ontario because there's a need for electricity. In New York, in New England, they burn na uh, natural gas, shale gas, because they don't have access to electricity. Uh, well, they don't have access to renewable electricity. So basically, while they burn shale gas in, uh, in, uh, in New York, and overall their cost is more, much higher, much higher than, than our cost in Quebec, 
then we just use cheap hydroelectricity for usages that could be basically uh, lowered by, by, different, uh, by different policies or, or changing behaviors. So there is a need and there is a, 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 an occasion for optimizing the whole thing. And this is basically what I want to show here in my presentation. And, and I'll run some, I've run some models with some colleagues showing you some numbers. If we decarbonize every single uh, piece of that puzzle independently or jointly, there are some cost differences. And these cost differences are extremely important. Uh, just to show again the difference in install capacity by region, here you, get, uh, you have New England on the left, New York, the Maritimes, Quebec, with the install capacity, it's all blue, but not all blue. It's, uh, there's a lot of blue because that's a hydro, so there's a lot of hydro. There's even more wind in Quebec than there is in New York and New England combined. So uh, even though we have a lot of, of cheap hydro, we decided that we wanted even more green uni uh, electricity. And we invested in a lot of uh, wind, almost as much as uh, Ontario that you see on the right. Uh, and there's a lot of hydro also you see in, in uh, the Maritimes. But that's the big, the big chunk of that. That's 5,000 megawatt at your Churchill Fall uh, uh, power plant uh, dam, which is basically connected to the Quebec system and is sold to the Quebec system. So the hydro you see, the blue line you see in the middle, the blue bar should basically be put into the Quebec system so at this point because it's the Churchill Fall uh, um, uh, dam that basically produced 30 terawatt hour per year sold at a quarter of a cent to Quebec, Hydro-Quebec. So there's a lot of hydro in Quebec. Uh, and you can see other places, New York, New England, I was saying there's a lot of natural gas. This is the light blue you see, a lot of natural gas. They still have some coal, a little bit, still have some uh, uh, oil-powered power plant. So they're not used much, but they're still there. And there are the nuclear power plant in white at the, on the top uh, in uh, New England, New York, and Ontario. You see Ontario capacity as a huge, uh, uh, about 10,000 megawatt of nuclear power plant. So that's, that's a lot, but Quebec has a lot. So the idea is to basically, if we want to decarbonize that, well, we'll basically get rid of all the natural gas, coal, and oil, then the hydro will remain. The nuclear could remain or could not remain. That depends on the kind of choices and what what we think is green or not green. And of course, there, there might be some wind uh, and solar. And of course, there'll be some wind and solar if we want to decarbonize. Now, that was the supply, now the demand. I already mentioned the demand, and here you see the hourly demand for 2016 in all the five regions that we are considering. And in yellow, on the top, uh, on the top uh, during the winter, so you have the first hour of the year until the the 8,660 hours in a day, in a year. I mean, so you have the whole year, all the hourly loads, and Quebec is a winter peaking region, so that's why we see high load during the winter, so at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, during the summer, it's not very uh, warm in Quebec, so we don't cool, there's not much air conditioning, but there is lots of air conditioning in New York, New England, even in Ontario, so that's why you see the um, loads going up in the, in the summer, in the middle of the year, in, in, uh, in Ontario, New York, and New England. So would it be only by mixing the, the peak of the different systems, there would be some savings. Because here, and that's the, 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 the drama of our planning, and that was mentioned by Stefan Schott in, his, uh, in, his, in one of his concluding slides, every region is planning alone. So Ontario is planning for its own demand. Quebec is planning for its own demand. And we're building enough capacity in Quebec to meet our load during the winter. And same wise, New York and New England and Ontario are building their own capacity to meet their own uh, needs during their peak load. So basically, if you add all the peaks of the different regions, then the sum of all the peaks are leading to 100, 124 uh, gigawatt of capacity, required capacity. But then if you look at the integrated region, and if you just sum the real peak at the same time, then you only have a peak, a total peak of 105 gigawatt. So that's, that's an easy computation. It's basically, you see, if we look at all the peaks, then it brings us at a much higher level. But the peak, the winter peak during, in Quebec uh, 
you know, don't, are not at the same time as the, as the, the summer peak. So that basically, at, looking at the whole region, you don't, don't get or you don't need to build how much, well, the same level of capacity if you integrate the, 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 the systems. Of course, you will need transmission lines to be able to meet loads and then to, to share the capacity. But the, so the, the, the exercise that we need to do is to look at, well, what if we do isolated planning, the business as usual, what we're doing now, versus integrated planning. And this is the type of exercise we've conducted and we're building. Uh, there's, there are good reasons for doing that. You know, even if we're not, we're not thinking in terms of climate policy, there, would be, there, there could be a business opportunity there. Uh, and that business opportunity has never been studied deeply or considered seriously by provinces across Canada uh, for a long time. And that's not only an Eastern problem. Look at, at Ontario, uh, not Ontario, but Alberta and BC. They don't talk when, when it comes to electricity. Alberta is planning its own uh, uh, requirements in terms of green uh, purchases. And then at the same time, BC is trying to build uh, uh, Site C, the hydro dam. Has there been talks to see, well, can, could Site C be used in Alberta for some uh, wind balancing? These talks, you know, they may happen sometimes, but not officially, and they're not being studied uh, in, in, you know, in any, any detailed manner. So I'm not saying I'm studying them in a very detailed manner, but still, I'm trying to show what kind of benefits, and I'll show you the benefits in, in a few minutes. Uh, but then there are additional reasons, you know, business, beyond the business case I, I showed you, the potential business case I showed you here, uh, there are additional goals. You know, we, Ontario, Quebec, and New York, and New England, we all have serious goals in terms of reducing emissions. So it's not only Quebec and Ontario that have the cap and trade, the WCI that we've mentioned, but New York and New England, they also have very serious goals in terms of reducing greenhouse gases. And although it's not all coming from the electricity sector, they have a, a significant share that is coming from the electricity sector. And of course, if they want to decarbonize, they'll have to electrify, so their load will grow. So again, they will have probably a lot of, of, uh, of needs for additional uh, capacity. And, but they're serious, they have the REGI. The REGI, we've mentioned it also, it's the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that is covering New York, New England, um, uh, Maryland, uh, Delaware, and, and now we've learned today uh, New Jersey is coming back. And they have a cap that is going down, and it's a, it's a, it's a cap and trade system specific for the power sector. So they are committed to reducing emissions in the power sector. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons to believe that that region in particular the Northeast region is very dedicated to uh, climate change uh, fight and to electrification. So this is what we've run, and here you have the main, you know, the core of the benefits. So we, 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 we did build a model where basically in the model I showed you the load, the hourly load, so it's an hourly uh, model where basically we need to meet all the loads that we've seen here. So there's no reaction, these are given. We need to, to supply electricity to meet all these loads. Uh, so we, we don't have we haven't run many scenarios. We just say if this is the load we need to meet and to supply, what is the least cost uh, way of supplying that load given the cost of these different technologies? So we as an input we have the technology cost of all these technologies, uh, and then we just run an optimization model to see how we can uh, basically supply the load at the least cost. So if there's no carbon cap. If there's no carbon cap, basically that's on the left side, you case one and two, basically the total cost of running the system, you, and the only thing we keep is the hydro. So we keep the hydro because the hydro is there, it's built for more than 100 years. So we keep the hydro, but then we need investments in whatever technology is needed. And if there's no carbon cap, basically running the, the whole uh, system would cost 20 billion a, a year. Uh, if we integrate, then we, we, so the business as usual, it's 20 billion, and that means basically we built in each region their own capacity, and if we integrate, then we avoid uh, some capacity in some places, and we cut the cost down to 19, uh, 19 billion. And that's without any transmission constraint, and if we keep the current transmission constraint, then of course it's a little bit more expensive because with current transmission constraint, the electricity doesn't flow as well, so basically you need to build more capacity in different regions. Now, if you need to, if, we, if, you, could, if you put a cap, if you, could, if put, you put your carbon cap and, and you want to reduce by 
your emissions and you build a new system, then you increase your total cost by $10 billion. And I'll show you basically what happens. In the first case, in the no-cap case, we have emissions of 180 million tons of, of, uh, of, of uh, greenhouse gases. Basically, on the bottom, we have hydro. In the first case, we only built natural gas. So basically, there's no wind, no solar. It's only natural gas because at the cost of natural gas and the price of the cost of building natural gas power plant, it's very cheap. Now, if you put a cap and you want to reduce by 80%, you get at 30 megawatt, uh, 30 mega uh, million tons. Then basically, you see some wind appearing. You see some nuclear appearing, a significant amount of uh, 40,000 megawatt of nuclear capacity appearing. And you also have a lot of uh, natural gas that you don't, you, don't, you don't use that natural gas very much. It's just for balancing purposes. You use that natural gas for balancing purposes. Now, if you want an all, uh, if you want an all only renewable, if you want to have your carbon cap and you don't want nuclear power, power which is a legitimate uh, option, then you increase your cost by a huge amount. From 30 billion, you move to 60, uh, six, uh, 60 billion dollars if you include the current transmission constraint. So with the current uh, transmission constraint, uh, it, it, it moves to 60 billion dollars. And then you see you built a lot more wind, you, you built a lot of solar power, you still have some natural gas for balancing purposes, and then you have to build a lot of energy storage. And you see the energy storage uh, on the top, you have a lot of energy storage. And on the right hand side, that's without, well, with the current transmission system. So you are extremely limited in terms of exchange. Now, if we remove the transmission constraint, so we've just run a scenario, the case five, there's no transmission constraint within the region. So basically the electricity can move as it wants across the five regions. And you see the cost is going down from 60 million down to 42 billion, sorry, 60 billion, 58 billion to 42 billion. So just without transmission constraint, you reduce the investment cost by a huge amount, and that basically is cutting a lot of the needed solar power and storage power. Basically because then if you have enough transmission capacity, so no transmission constraint, everything can flow from the different regions and you can optimize the region. 60, 16, 16 billion dollars a year. This is the annual power cost. So 16 billion dollars a year in saving if we do the integrated planning and we have enough transmission capacity to have the, uh, the, 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 the electrons to move around. So this is significant. This is the kind of results we, we need to share and show to our policy makers. Uh, we are thinking ahead. And of course, you know, there are a lot of details that are not included. And of course, load could change. You know, of course, this, all these loads can change. And the dynamic of loads can change. But still, these are kind of basic results. And this is the kind of modeling results and simulations we need to do to understand what is implied <laughs> if we want to decarbonize and electrify the grid. Uh, so uh, just to finish, just to show Denmark. What have they done in Denmark to, to electrify their system and to uh, decarbonize their system? They have built a lot of transmission lines. Uh, Denmark has 14 gigawatt of capacity. The, the, the peak load in, in Denmark is 5 gigawatt, but they have lots and uh, a lot of transmission lines going to Norway, Sweden, uh, Germany. They are building transmission lines to the UK, to the Netherlands. So basically, you will not avoid these transmission lines. This is how we can integrate wind. And you see here the loads of, in terms of wind. If you want to integrate the wind, and in case of Denmark, we have up to, on average 40% of wind, then you need to have these transmission lines to, uh, to uh, export your wind when you have surpluses and import that. So basically, that not, that is, what I'm saying here is that it's not a case against decentralized production or uh, it's it's simply a case that we need to have a lot of new additional capacities we'll need a lot of solar a lot of wind it will be decentralized but we will still need to integrate markets and to have transmission lines going across a jurisdiction to lower the cost if we don't want to lower the cost then basically we'll end up on my case six here 
In case six, the business as usual without transmission and will have extremely <coughs> high cost. If we do integrate, then basically we'll go to my case five, where we'll have uh, a lot of interconnections and integrated planning, and we will uh, save a lot of money. It will cost us more in terms of direct cost than just uh, going the, the natural gas way, but it will be sustainable. And of course, over the long run, we want to be sustainable even if it is it's more costly. So I want to thank you. I want to thank the Institut Energie Trottier who, is, uh, who did finance a little bit my, my research and the team that is uh, working with me on that. And I thank you for your attention.